Here is Justin Chiani. Uh, Justin's going to talk more about this project. Uh, Justin's with the Moami Mo River Lake Sturgeon Restoration Program, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alpena Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. All right, thank you. Uh, so as Tom mentioned, my name is Justin Shiat, or at least that's how we pronounce it in Michigan. For those of you who work in D.C., Shiati. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about a project that we're really excited about that's taking place in the western basin of, uh, of Lake Erie. And uh, before I get started, I just wanted to mention all of the co-authors and partners on this work. Just like Jim and Ed presented, there's a lot of different people involved with this project. Um, this is an international project between the United States and Canada. There are several state agencies, the Michigan DNR, Ohio DNR, um, there are federal agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, oh, also the province of Ontario, um, several universities, the University of Windsor, the University of Toledo, and also private entities, and one of them is uh, Purdy Fisheries a commercial fishing company in Sarnia, Ontario. So all of these people play a significant role in this project and all of them have a unique niche and expertise that they kind of provide, which will hopefully make this project a success. All right, so for those of you who know a little bit about Lake Sturgeon, you've probably seen this map before. Uh, historically, it was estimated that there's about 19 different areas in Lake Erie that contain Lake Sturgeon populations. And from some of the work that Tim has done and Ron Brook have done, it was estimated that there's anywhere, there was anywhere from 300,000 to 1.1 million adults. As we know now, that uh, number has greatly declined. And it's currently believed that the Lake Erie Lake Sturgeon population is supported by two systems. And these systems are on each side of the lake. There's a population in the upper Niagara River and there's also a population in the St. Clair Detroit River system, the, the work that Ed and Jim have uh, talked about today. <coughs> the population in the St. Clair Detroit River system is quite large, estimated between maybe 30,000 to 50,000 adult fish in the system. So one of the thoughts has been that this population will serve as a source population to recolonize some of those tributaries in Lake Huron and Lake Erie that once supported populations. So fortunately, um, there was a project that's been going on since 2011, led by Dr. Daryl Hondor, part of the U.S. Geological Survey. And we've been implanting acoustic transmitters in adult lake sturgeon over the past six years. Um, so this is just a map of some of the acoustic receivers in the, in the Great Lakes. And a, a part of this project was to just basically look at lake sturgeon movement in the St. Clair Detroit River system, but also look at movement up into Lake Huron and down into Lake Erie. So in total, there were 282 fish that received acoustic transmitters, and out of all 282 fish, 19 of those fish at some point went out into Lake Erie. And out of those 19, 17 of them were initially tagged in the Detroit River. So it's kind of a lower proportion of fish than we actually thought were going out into Lake Erie. One of the kind of cool things that was going on concurrently at the same time is that there were other acoustic telemetry projects taking place in the Western Basin. And these yellow stars here represent historical lake sturgeon tributaries. And at these sites, we had acoustic receivers at the mouths. So any lake sturgeon that we had tagged theoretically could be detected going up these, up these historical tributaries. Um, out of all the fish uh, tagged, and just as far as now with, with the data, no fish have been detected moving up any of these tributaries. Obviously habitat could be a concern, maybe the systems don't have sufficient habitat um, for the, um, to support a population, but that kind of led us to these preliminary results. We're still getting more information, um, but that recolonization of historical tributaries in Lake Erie due to strain from the St. Clair Detroit River System population might be a slow process. Therefore, uh, supplemental stocking might be necessary to achieve restoration targets over shorter time scales in tributaries that can support a reintroduction. And that's kind of a key thing here, tributaries that can support a reintroduction. So one of the tributaries we think can support a lake sturgeon population is the Maumee River. 
Um, historically, there was a lake sturgeon population in the Maumee River. Smith and Snell reported an early decrease of sturgeon in the river, where sturgeon once ran up the river by the hundreds as far as the rapids above Perrysburg, but at present, in 1885, they're absent, and it's currently believed that the lake sturgeon population is extirpated. There has been some, or some contemporary work done on the Maumee River to see if there's still a lake sturgeon population that exists there. Jim Boas did some work in the mid-2000s um, using egg mats to look at spawning lake sturgeon, deploying gill nets and set lines to look at adults, however, didn't detect any spawning, didn't collect any adults. And uh, the University of Toledo has done quite a bit of work in the system with some graduate students working on, working on some projects. Um, looking at larval drift and egg mats, and they also haven't detected any lake sturgeon. So it's pretty much thought that the lake sturgeon population is extirpated. So the next few slides are going to kind of go through the process of how this restor restoration program was developed. So in the fall of 2013, there was a meeting at the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge between the Ohio DNR, Toledo Zoo, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Lake Erie Waterkeeper. So the Lake Erie Waterkeeper's name is Sandy Bin. She kind of organized this meeting. And she wanted to embark on a project that would raise awareness about the Lake Erie watershed and current problems with the AOC, right around the time of the toxic algal blooms. You know, hot, hot topic in 2013. So one potential project was to rear lake sturgeon in the Maumee River and have annual outreach events that would promote aquatic stewardship within the watershed. Um, Sandy had recently been at some of the streamside rearing facility releases. I said, wow, this is a pretty good idea. And so um, she wanted to run with it. Obviously, it's not that easy. There are definitely steps we have to go through before we start stocking a system with fish. Um, so in the winter of 2014, we had another meeting at the Toledo Zoo. Now, this was between the Ohio DNR, Toledo Zoo, and Fish and Wildlife Service. And we started discussing the potential of streamside rearing. Um, it's been mentioned here quite a few other times today. Um, Streamside rearing has been kind of the default approach for stocking fish in Lakes Michigan and Lake Superior. And luckily, the Toledo Zoo is right on the Maumee River. And they were interested in this project, so we knew that there was an opportunity there. But before restoration could begin, one of the big things we had to figure out was, could the Maumee River support a lake sturgeon population? We needed to figure out the habitat suitability. So, um, in the summer of 2014, the Fish and Wildlife Service funded a graduate student with the University of Toledo named Jessica Sherman, and she was tasked with determining the amount of spawning and H0 rearing habitat in the system. So that was one of the chapters of her dissertation. And the Ohio DNR also said, well, we need a restoration plan. Everything that's going on, we want to make sure that we have a restoration plan that's vetted through our state agency. So another chapter of her dissertation was to develop a restoration plan outlining the details of the project. And some of the restoration plan um, goals or components included the restoration goals, uh, the biology and historical status of Lake Sturgeon, the current habitat conditions and any con uh, constraints, stocking considerations, how we determine success, we wanted to have an education and outreach component, uh, enforcement and also long-term management. Of the, of the population. So I have a couple of results slide here, not, not, not too many. Um, so these are some of the results from Jessica Sherman's habitat suitability model. And she was just looking at spawning adult and age zero fish. And some of the habitat characteristics that she assessed were substrate, water depth, water velocity, and water temperature. She used all of these characteristics to develop a spatially explicit HSI model for each life stage. Jessica has finished this work. She's finishing up her dissertation. And this map is for the spawning adults habitat. The green, which is kind of hard to see here on the map, is good habitat. The yellow is moderate. And the red is poor. But overall, she estimated that there is about 192 hectares of good lake sturgeon spawning habitat and about almost 1,000 hectares of moderate spawning habitat for lake sturgeon in the system. So this is uh, another slide, pretty much the same thing, but looking at habitat for the H0 fish. Green is good, yellow is moderate, red is poor. Uh, for H0 habitat, she estimated about 429 hectares of good habitat and over 1,000 hectares of 
moderate habitat. So this is what we needed. You know, we wanted to make sure we did our homework, and if we embarked on a, on a project like this, that we could say, well, it, we did our homework, and it looks like the habitat is suitable to begin a restoration program on this system. So the overall goal of the project is to create a self-sustaining adult lake sturgeon population of about 1,500 adults. Um, some of the objectives that have been complete to date include, well, can the Maumee River support a population? Jessica did that work through the habitat suitability models. Um, she has a restoration plan. We've all kind of worked on that together, developing a restoration plan, and currently that plan is in review by the Lake Erie Committee. One of the hardest things is to, keep, uh, to secure funding for the project. So we were working on that over the past few years, and just this past fall, we received a grant through the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act for $90,000 to support infrastructure costs and building the facility. So in total, we had, um, we'd also received $80,000 in funding from Region 3 Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So about $170,000 to build the uh, facility and infrastructure components. So now these are kind of the next steps. Where are we going next and objectives that we need to complete? Obviously, the, the rearing facility is currently being constructed by the Toledo Zoo uh, with support from Doug Aloisi and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And one of the things we want to do is annually stock out 3,000 uh, fingerlings into the Maumee River. But the plan is to stock out 1,500 fingerlings from a streamside rearing facility and then also stock out 1,500 fingerlings from a traditional hatchery. And the reason we wanted to do this is to kind of evaluate imprinting and adult returns between the two different stocking strategies. Traditional strategy versus the streamside strategy. Um, we're going to be conducting some biological monitoring and also hopefully have a large education and outreach component with this work, um, working with the Toledo Zoo. So this is a picture of uh, the Hell Vendor rearing facility operated by the zoo. <coughs> the streamside rearing facility inside will look very similar, except it won't have these glass aquariums. It's going to have 10 big circular tanks. Um, we do plan on rearing fish by individual families. So we'll have 10 different tanks. And um, the rearing facility will be constructed from a 10 foot by 40 foot trailer, so a little bit larger than some of the other streamside rearing facilities that maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, going to have egg incubating jars, 10 rearing tanks. It's going to be staffed by the Toledo Zoo and the Ohio DNR, but also with support from the, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, it will have Maumee River water pulled, pulled in here at, at the site on the zoo property. So for our stocking strategy, some of the methods that we're going through right now, um, annually stock 3,000 fingerlings. The donor population will be coming from the St. Clair River in southern Lake Huron. We already mentioned that this is one of the largest spawning populations of, of fish in the, in the Great Lakes. Last year, for instance, we collected uh, 38 black egg females during our, during our assessments. Uh, this is known as genetic stocking unit one. And hopefully each year we'll collect 10 females and 50 males for a total of 200 females and 1,000 males over the duration of the project. Um, these fish, we have a really unique opportunity here um, to do this project because we're working with Purdy Fisheries, a commercial fish company who's really helped out over the last 10 to 20 years on, on some of these projects. And uh, they have some large raceways in the upper St. Clair River to hold fish. These raceways are eight foot in width and 40 to 50 foot long and they hold three foot of water. So during the gamut collection process, we're gonna be able to have fish housed at their facility in St. Clair River water. All right, so for some of the biological monitoring and research questions associated with this, um, here are just, just a few of the questions we hope to address. Uh, do lake sturgeon culture in a streamside rearing facility exhibit higher stocking uh, site fidelity rates compared to a traditional hatchery? We hope to do that by looking at adult returns. Obviously, it's going to be a long time before we get any information, and I'll almost be retired <laughs> even then, so not too worried about it. Um, uh, what are the differences in post-stocking survival rates between streamside reared lake sturgeon and those reared in a traditional hatchery setting? 
Um, we plan on looking at survival using acoustic telemetry. Chris Vandergoot and Trevor Pitcher, University of Windsor, are, are helping us with, with this work. And also looking at recaptures from assessments that we do, and also working with commercial fishermen out in Lake Erie from Ontario and the state of New York. They get out there, they collect a lot more fish than a lot more nets than we can ever imagine. So hopefully we'll be able to draw upon some of them too um, to help answer these questions. Uh, one of the last questions is, is, what is the contribution of lake sturgeon stocked from the Maumee River to adjoining waters? Are they moving into any other system or not? You know, I think we have a unique opportunity here because there's, as far as we know, there's no current recruitment or any other tributaries in the Lake Erie Basin that support the lake sturgeon population besides the Niagara and besides the St. Clair River. So if they stray up into the St. Clair River, well, that's where they came from. We're not really too, too worried about that. So we hope to answer that question by uh, telemetry and recaptures as well. You know, both Jim and Ed and Nancy and, and uh, have all talked about outreach ceremonies and how important that is, or outreach and education. We hopefully, and we will have a large outreach component associated with this work. We're going to hopefully draw upon other release ceremonies that are going on in the Great Lakes. Um, and also there are additional possibilities with the Toledo Zoo. They do some large outreach events annually. So we're kind of excited to see how we might increase awareness not only to the Maumee River watershed, but also for, for lake sturgeon in the Great Lakes. So this is just a short, really quick timeline of where we're at in this project. Um, our next step is the spring of 2017. We're going to be doing a pilot gamete collection year. Um, this was Jim's idea, not to just get uh, go full in and start in 2018, but to kind of figure out some of the details in 2017. So we're going to collect uh, eggs from a few female uh, females in the spring of 2017. It's going to be some uh, logistical challenges because we're collecting fish in both the United States and Canada, so there's a lot of committing issues that we still have to go through. Um, and we're also going to do some pre-biological monitoring in the fall of 2017. But 2018 is going to be our first year of rearing fish. Um, that's going to be done in the spring, and hopefully we'll have a fall stocking ceremony in 2018, which would be the first year of actually stocking these fish out into Lake Erie. And with that, I guess I'll take any questions if there's time. And I just wanted to put this slide up here because this is what the Hellbender Rearing Facility looks like on the Toledo Zoo property. Our facility is going to be located on the river closer, but this gives you an idea kind of what we're kind of looking at here. So, thanks. was are we going to blend uh, Maumee River water with some other source and hopefully we can use Maumee River water however we do know that there might be some water temperature issues in the summer in the Maumee River so there will be the capability to use another source if we need to chill the water for survival if we want to. Yeah, we, we do blend in Wisconsin and it's not because of temperature as much as it is because of other sediment flows and other things that are coming in when the water supply that messes up the whole atmosphere. You know, the, the goal is to um, have the facility up and running this, this next year so we can hopefully work out some sediment issues and stuff too. And I think uh, I've worked at a stream, I worked at a stream side rearing facility earlier on, and I know there's, you know there's issues that are associated with that. So um, I just try to make all the project partners aware that, yeah, we definitely need to go through the motions here and figure this out. Thanks. All right. Thanks again, Justin.